I do feel like I've been given a word from him. It's been confirmed in many multiple ways. Some you would not have even imagined would be confirmations from God, but they were. Um, and today I'd like to speak on the topic of brokenness matters. And if you turn with me to Psalms chapter 51, I tried to get that to give you a different talk. You said, no, that's what I was feeling. So, um, Psalms chapter 51, and I'd like you to read verse 16 and 17 with me. And it says, the word of God says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but just as an introduction, I want to share with you, a little over 10 years ago, my mom got to go on the trip of a lifetime. Sister Margaret invited her to tour Israel for a week. Amazing. I got to see all of the places that we read about in the Bible. She took pictures. She's got wonderful stories and memories that she gets to keep, but she brought back to me a white, pearly alabaster box. You see, I used to sing the song, you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. And so when she saw it, she thought of me. And I loved this, just, this token of love for my mom. And I immediately took it home and I put it up on this shelf right by the bedroom door. It was a black shelf. So the contrast between the pearly white and that black shelf, oh, that, that alabaster box was hot. But all it took was one day for the bedroom door to be slammed with just enough velocity that the wall shook just enough and my prized alabaster box slipped from the shelf down to the floor, forever cracked and broken. I'm sure like I was, and still do to this day, you're thinking of the woman who broke the alabaster box and let the oil pour out on the feet of Jesus. And so as I began to prepare for today, throughout the week, I actually learned things that I never knew. And I studied it to prove myself that that was wrong and what I knew was right. And, you know, um, if you do a little bit more research and you find me to be wrong, that's okay. Um, but in the Gospels, we read four different counts of a woman who broke an alabaster box. Three of the counts measure up so closely that we can say that they are complementary to one another. The fourth one is quite different. Three of them tell about a woman who came in, she broke the, uh, the alabaster box, it says that she was in Simon the leper's house. And they had sat down to eat, it was two weeks before the Passover, and she broke this alabaster box, she anointed his head, she knelt at his feet, she, she cleaned his feet, and she dried it with his hair. We can see then the, the disciples became irate. Why would you let her take this costly ointment and, and anoint your feet? We could have sold that and fed the poor. And John, in the Gospel of John, he lets us know that was Judas. And we all know Judas was up to no good by this point. Um, he liked to take the money and say he was using it to feed the poor, but he was usually doing his own thing with it. Um, and immediately after that story took place, we see that Judas went out and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Why am I telling you this story? I'll come to it. Hang with me. The other count in Luke tells of a woman who was a sinner. She had a reputation of a sinner. Everyone in town knew she was a sinner. The Bible doesn't tell us her name, and the Bible doesn't tell us her sin. But we, knew, we do know she had the reputation of sin. But when she heard that Jesus was in this city, the city is also unnamed, when, we heard, when she heard that he was in the city, the Bible says she went into the house where he sat at the table with a group, and, and she broke the oil, the alabaster box, over his head, and she fell down at his feet, and she began to weep, and she cried over his feet and dried them with her hair. These are two very similar accounts because it was the custom of the day that when you were traveling and you went into the home and your feet are dusty and dirty, if you were a guest in the home, then the servants would bow before you and they would wash your feet and dry them and then you could sit and eat. 
It was a custom. It was also a custom of the day that when a king was anointed, their head was anointed and the oil ran down. So we see in both of these situations, Jesus is being recognized as king, and they are maintaining themselves as his servant. One comes because he's forgiven much. They loved, she loved him much because she had been forgiven much. The other one comes because she's his friend. He was there when her brother died, John tells us. He was there when she went through catastrophe. He cried with her. And she said, you're my king and I'm your servant. I'm telling you today, you have two situations of brokenness. One's come from sin. And one's come from love. One, they're both in choice. I can tell you, you've heard my testimony, and I'm, today, is this message is not about that. When you go through life situations, do you know that doesn't necessarily bring brokenness? It brings opportunity for brokenness. In that catastrophe or that life crisis, you have a choice. You might be going through financial trauma. You might be going through family drama. You might have made horrible choices that have led you to where you are. Much like the woman in Luke chapter 7. She was full of her life's choices that broke her. That brought her to the place where she didn't even deserve to be in the presence of Jesus. So you might be going through those things, but you have a choice. You can allow yourself to be broken. Or you can come, become bitter. You might be sitting there saying, Sister Jody, this is a great message for the ladies. Any men feeling that way today? It's a great message for the ladies. But let me share with you two keys. And this is the third slide, I believe. I'm sorry. I was supposed to be getting confused. I forgot. I got carried away. Um, the first king, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, tells us of a king who was told to go up against the Amalekites. No, next one. Sorry. Next slide. Okay. I'm out of it. 1 Samuel 15 tells us of a king who was told to go up against the Amalekites and to utterly destroy, utterly destroy the enemy and take no spoils. This king was told by the prophet of God, which was the voice of God to him. And when he went up against King Agag, he decided, well, I'm going to let you live. And the children of Israel decided to take the best of the spoils, the best sheep, the best riches. They took them home because why should they go to waste? This king was King Saul. He ignored the commandment of God, which in comparison to other people's sins, really probably on, on our scale, isn't quite as bad what, as what some others might have done. But the problem was when Samuel came to King Saul and said, hey, why do I hear sheep bleeding in the pasture? You disobeyed the voice of God. He sinned. He had the opportunity to break himself, and he didn't. He said, he tried to justify it. Well, you know, it's okay to show kindness because then they're going to show kindness to us. And then he tried to blame it on other people. He did not humble himself. He did not let himself be broken. As a result, that day, God rejected him as king. We're presented with another prominent king of the children of Israel. This king, I mean, his sin was huge. He fell into great moral sin with one of his soldiers' wives. Got her pregnant and then tried to cover her up. So let's send him to the front. Let, well, first bring him home. Then it was all that didn't work. He had integrity. So send him to the front lines. Had him killed so that he cover up his own sin. And when Nathan, the prophet of God, came before this king, and he said, there was a, there was a, a man who had a son, they had, they had tons of sheep, and then there was this other man in the fields, and he had no sheep, and he went over and he took this, or the, I'm sorry, the man with lots of sheep took the one, the one sheep away, and now they left them with none, and king, the king said, who's that man? And the prophet Nathan said, you're that man. You had everything. And you took that man's wife, huh? You took that man's wife. And this king's response was Psalms chapter 51. 
which was the beginning of our text. I'd like to take us there because when you hear this man's reply, in his brokenness, we find that he took on sackcloth, he took on ashes, which is prayer and fasting. He, he broke himself before God. And he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with wisdom, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And we all love to say this part, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness or shame. O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And then he says, for thou desirest not sacrifice. And here he's referring to when they would go to the temple, they had to sacrifice the lambs to cover their sins. And he's saying, you don't want that yet. You don't want the sacrifice of blood yet. If you, don't, if you wanted that, I could do it. I would do it. I would do it to the letter of the law. You don't want the burnt offerings. You want a broken spirit. You want a broken and a contrite heart. And I sat there with this and I said, but why God? Why is the brokenness so important? Why do we have to go through the family drama, the financial trauma, everything else? Why? Why do we have to go through brokenness? And he said, if you don't go through the life crises, or if you don't allow yourself to be broken, you'll never recognize when I'm calling you to humble yourself in my presence. You'll never know when I'm calling you to that place of repentance. And if you don't go through brokenness, and you don't humble yourself, and you don't have a repentant heart, how will you reach them? They were two men. They made very different choices and had very different results. Brother Sam quoted in a prayer this morning, which was another confirmation. In 1 Peter 5, 5, the very end of that verse, it said, God resists the proud, but he draws the humble unto him. So many times we ask God, I want your anointing. I want your power. Her brother Ben pray that today. We want your power. We want to reach the lost. And all God is saying to you is then humble yourselves before me. Let that brokenness bring you to a place where you will cry out to me. Because it's not through what you can do. It's not by your mind. It's not by your power. You won't. I'm not taking away from what you said. You and I believe Sir Rudy would agree with me. You don't save the lost. You're the vessel for him to save them. Brokenness is a lifestyle of agreeing with God about the true condition of our heart and our lives as he sees them. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle, not just a one-time choice. It's a lifestyle of unconditional, absolute surrender of our will to the will of God. A heart that says, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, Whenever you want me to do it, wherever you want me to do it, however you want me to do it. Brokenness, brokenness means the shattering of your alabaster box, the little treasure you built up. See, there's another man in the Bible that went to Jesus and he said, how can I make it to heaven? I'm, I'm ready to go to heaven. 
And Jesus said, well, what makes you so good? Well, I have done the commandments since I was a young child. And Jesus said, okay, can you go sell everything you have? Can you bring yourself down to nothing and follow me? All right. And that rich young ruler said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Brokenness produces true humility. Our response to brokenness brings humility that produces obedience to the Word of God and what the Spirit of God is saying to us. Until our pride is broken, we will not humble ourselves before God. We might call Him our King, but will we call ourselves His servants? Today I could tell you again about life crises that have brought brokenness forth. But the truth is the spirit of brokenness doesn't always have to come as a result of that crisis. With that being said, brokenness doesn't have to come as a result of the crisis either. You can choose to blame God and walk away. Or you can choose to say, here I am, God. I don't have anything left but broken pieces. But your word tells me, and I'm going to hold you to your word, that you can take what's broken and make it beautiful. Your word says that in your time, all things will be made beautiful. But let's say today, maybe you're sitting there and you're going, I'm a friend of God. I'm not at a place of life crisis. I'm his friend. We're good. Then I ask you today, 